Hello and welcome. Just uh, just wanted to check this out. Seems to be good. Um, okay, good evening and welcome. Let's just turn that down. Right. Um, so, <coughs> welcome to the third lecture in uh, the Plato and Deleuze course from the Free University of Brighton. Um, as you may notice, I've, I'm in a different space um, from usual. You don't see the big pile of books behind. They're all actually over there. Um, and I've been moving house. What's your machinators? How are you doing? Um, yeah, I've been not moving house. I've been moving rooms, but it's been it felt like moving house. Uh, so it's been a bit busy and a bit hectic. Um, so yeah, all weekend. Up and down the stairs. We, I live in a tall, thin house. Um, up and down the stairs, carrying loads of stuff. Tons and tons of books. Putting new shelves up. Moving people into other rooms. All good, but very tiring. So I'm a little tired tonight. But this is, as I say, third, the third lecture in the Plato and Deleuze course. And tonight... Um, let's just uh, let's bring you up here. Tonight... We're going to be looking at dialectic and learning. So the idea of this, uh, what dialectic and learning refer to, are, um, I suppose, the method uh, that Plato was using. So we're trying to look a little bit at kind of the method. Um, now, obviously, we're reading the Phaedrus at the moment, and this is uh, the second lecture on the Phaedrus. And so it's the Phaedrus specifically... Um, that we're looking at in terms of content but when we're looking at method we're looking at things that we might find in other texts as well obviously um, and next week we'll be moving on to the sophist and we'll find uh, a key kind of example of one of the things we're going to talk about tonight in that uh, in that dialogue but, but bearing in mind that we're still trying to read Plato and at this point trying to read the Phaedrus um, this relationship to dialectic and learning has a kind of specific, uh, a specific focus inside the Phaedrus. Um, it originally begins with a focus on um, the rhetorician or the person who's able to teach you how to speak well. Um, and Lysias uh, and his speech kind of start us in that direction, start us with that point. But it continues to turn, kind of, kind of explore how would you speak well, and then develops a question about how you would write well, because obviously. Um, Lysias's speech that Phaedrus gives to Socrates at the start of the dialogue is a written speech. Um, it's something that he's carrying with him and there's a whole little scene at the start, a whole little play um, where Socrates is essentially trying to get Phaedrus to read him the speech um, and Phaedrus is trying to uh, use Socrates as a space or a place in which he can learn the speech and there's a little sort of play right at the start where they kind of have a little... Um, you know, uh, a little joshing with each other as to whether um, Phaedrus is going to read Socrates' speech. So it's a dialectic and learning here, it's about how to speak well, how to write well, um, but behind this question um, are more fundamental questions about how it is we, we, we are able to learn, because one of the things that the, the rhetorician rhetorician um, the, 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 the teacher of rhetoric <laughs> let's call him that the teacher of rhetoric call her that um, one of the things the teacher of rhetoric is doing is obviously doing something that you are learning um, and so there's going to be a kind of curious distinction um, something like you know what real learning is I mean that's essentially what Plato is going to try and point to and, and he's going to try and minimize some of these kind of techniques um, of learning uh, or techniques of rhetoric, for example, that you might learn, and talk and push towards something like um, what really is going on when we're learning. So the dialectic and learning are the two kind of themes for this evening. Um, let me just pop this up. So... <coughs> So as I say, we're going to be talking about the second half of the Phaedrus today. Um, we're going to be uh, 
the second half begins with this myth of the cicadas and roughly speaking it begins at around 257 260 if you remember these are the particular ways in which uh, platonic dialogue texts are referred to there's these particular numbers that are often in the margins um what's going on in that second half of the phaedrus is its focus as i've mentioned on rhetoric and writing and um, that's the content of the phaedrus uh in terms of what we directly encounter but there's obviously lots of other questions that are kicking around in the background and it's kind of it's these other questions that we're going to sort of focus on a little bit now one of the things one of the things that's interesting here is um in terms of that rhetoric and writing there's a, there's a very famous um and I, I touched upon it right at the end of the second lecture. There's a very famous encounter with this particular text of Plato um, by Derrida <coughs> in a text called Plato's Pharmacon. And it, it's a text that, play, that Derrida sees as like um, uh, typical of Plato and typical of a kind of way in which philosophy is done. Um, now that's that strange let's bring that back up for you this is that str this is derrida this is a strange word that's on this this thing here um logocentrism this word here um in other words uh, being focused or being centered on speech um there are other elements to logos as we might imagine in terms of uh, the word and also in terms of a kind of relationship to rationality um but derrida's derrida is essentially arguing that the philosophy has this unwarranted for derrida unwarranted emphasis or priority uh, that it presents on uh, you know, th that it gives to speech to, and to the face-to-face -face encounter and to the encounter in which people are present to each other um but it centers around a discussion in in the Phaedrus, which we're not going to we're not going to I'm not going to really focus on because this is not really what Deleuze focuses on. Um, and so when we're reading Plato and Deleuze, we <coughs> it, <coughs> it kind of <coughs> you know, there's only so many things we can cover. <coughs> but this particular element of, of the Phaedrus is very, very heavily discussed by Derrida. <coughs> Sorry about that. It's very heavily discussed by Derrida. And um, what? Uh, what we see is essentially um, Derrida begins focusing on a particularly small bit of the Phaedrus, and it's a bit of the Phaedrus in which we encounter the myth of Thoth or Tut. Um, and uh, Thoth is giving a king a gift, a series of gifts, and one of the gifts he gives him is this gift of writing. Um, and so Thoth is kind of the mythological origin or, or, or the source of writing. And Thoth offers the king this gift of writing and the king basically rejects it on the terms in which Thoth offers it. So it's offered in terms of um, improving memory. Um, and what what the king actually says is, no, it's not going to do that. It's actually going to make memory a lot worse because the kind of learning by heart, if you like, that we might encounter um as as a kind of fundamental relationship of memory this is going to get get sort of destroyed by these mnemonic devices these techniques and technologies that enable us to remember things um now that particular myth is very interesting and if you're interested in that kind of element of the phaedrus then derrida is a really interesting place to go and, and go and you know follow up that interest um he's not easy to read but it is definitely worth a look if you're interested particularly in the thoth myth and the writing but what i want to sort of focus on um is uh not so much those particular moments particularly around the thoth myth and the writing myth because for me, I want to I want to kind of emphasise that these these are um, not the ends of the discussion. They, 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 these things are, are brought brought in front of us by Socrates and Plato here as um, a means to something else, um, and that myth in itself is a kind of means to another another end. Um, and so, what I what I think is going on is not so much that that myth is being somehow presented as an account of writing it's it's being placed inside the dialogue as a teaching moment i mean and that's kind of crucial i mean one of the things that's very interesting about the dialogue is we see a whole series of moments at which 
Socrates is kind of trying to teach something trying to uh, and that's i think what's what's more interesting in a sense what is it he's trying to teach uh, and, and what kind of lessons um, are we meant to be drawing from this now this is all wrapped up in a conversation this is why i think it's part of a kind of teaching moment of socrates this is all wrapped up in a conversation and a discussion around um, what the dialectic is and th the method of right thinking that Socrates kind of wants to put forward here. Um, and so that's on the one hand, and that's kind of, you can find key bits of that at 266 and at 271. Um, but crucially, there's, and, and this is, this does show in a sense what Derrida would call the logocentrism in some sense, um, perhaps. But what crucially, what's going on, I think, um, for Socrates in this text uh, is encapsulated with a line that we, I find at 271 and this is to do with, with the relationship between learning and the voice we might say and that uh, that sort of let, let's say motto or that kind of rule is the following the function of speech is to influence the soul this is Socrates. The function of speech is to influence the soul. So let's look at that and look at look at the, the, the Phaedrus in light of that particularly key idea that's presented there, which is the function of speech is to influence the soul, um, as opposed to, for example, the mind, as opposed to the body, as opposed to the intellect. It's, it's specifically aimed at... Uh, as it were, the most, the innermost point of the subject, innermost point of the audience. This is the real function of speech um, for Socrates, and immediately we can counter that. We can contrast that rather with, you know, the function of speech um, from the teacher of rhetoric is to be able to persuade, or the function of speech is to communicate, or the function of speech is to express. Um, you know, express yourself, or something along those kind of lines. All of which may also be important functions of speech. Um, but that core element of the function of speech is to, Im you know, influence the soul. This is absolutely critical for Plato and I think, um, and for Socrates here. And I think it's kind of crucial, you know, um, that this is this is in a sense what's being taught, or or the lessons that Socrates wants us to draw are such that this this kind of key maxim that the function of speech is to influence the soul um, it may, is made clear or uh, makes sense. Okay, so let's turn then to the dialectic itself. Let's try and be a little bit sort of, you know, let's have some uh, specifics here. Um, and the way in which the dialectic is presented fundamentally um, is in these two terms, um, division and collection. These are the two elements of dialectic. So the dialectic in, in one sense is... Um, uh, informally refers to the, the process of, of engaging in a dialogue um, uh, it can also if if you're in if you're talking to a marxist or someone who's ex you know um, someone who's who's working within a kind of marxist framework or a framework that that draws upon marx um, or perhaps even hegel then the dialectic is going to have a different kind of notion there so it has a kind of different different content for, for hegel and for marx um, so there's an informal notion of the dialectic as kind of conversation or a dialogue. There's a Hegelian and a Marxist notion of dialectic, um, which is, let's say, not Plato's and not Socrates's. And then there's this Socratic um, or Platonic dialectic, um, the method of dialectic. And for the uh, Platonic, Socratic dialectic, the two key terms are division and collection. And by division, he means specification. So specifying, you know, what something is, and and there's a, as I say, there's a really interesting example of this. Um, there's a really interesting example of this uh, in the Sophist that we're going to encounter next week, um, where this division and specification process takes place, and the other process is collection and generalization. Um, so that's bringing things together under kind of the same heading. Um, so various different ca cats, various different chairs, various different you know houses, you know bringing them together and and like getting uh, a genus, a group um, of houses, um, and so 
Collection brings things together. Division sort of separates them apart. And it's the two moments of collection division um, that enable someone to be able to identify things correctly, to, to get at the nature of things, as Socrates will say. Um, now, the one term that, uh, that, that isn't quite there yet in it, but the one we keep I keep wanting to point back to is selection um, and so division uh, and collection but remember that there is this selection thing going on so this is the Phaedrus 266 if you want to go and like uh, look up what I'm talking about here and see it in in sort of in 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 action see it in the platonic text itself um, this is Socrates, and this is obviously, it might be slightly different in your own particular translation of the text, but this is mine. Um, so this is Socrates. I am a great lover of these methods of division and collection as instruments which enable me to speak and think. Hitherto, I have given those who possess this ability to speak and, and think um, the title of dialecticians. And so this is essentially the point at which we can clearly see Socrates kind of claiming this method um, and uh, identifying uh, the elements of this method. So this is the dialectic division and collection. Um, dialecticians, that's the kind of people that we're going to be looking at. Um, but let's begin with this method of division. So uh, the ability to divide into a particular species, uh, the ability to divide a genus into a species, and this is this is the kind of crucial moment. This is in Phaedrus two sixty five. The ability to divide to divide a genus into species, observing the natural articulation, not mangling any of the parts, like an unskillful butcher. Now that idea of observing the natural articulation, the idea is that you don't just um, take a particular genus, let's say cats, and um, try and specify particular kinds or type species of cats um, at random. You don't just do it at random and go, well, we've got orange ones and we've got, you know, uh, brindle ones and we've got big ones and little ones. <laughs> you know, I mean, those are those may be ways in which you you know you want to cut up and, and, and divide things. But the idea would be, and here say, observing the natural articulation to try and capture the patterns in nature. That's what you're trying to do. You're trying to reflect or respond to what you're seeing outside. You're not trying to just cut it up any way you feel like like an unskillful butcher um, and he gives an example uh, of of this kind of process that we've seen in the first couple of speeches um, so the example he gives is, is he can uh, Socrates himself contrasts the two speeches that he's given first response to Lysias the first kind of response that also says you know yes love lovers are mad and then a response to the blasphemy of that first speech and what he says is that in both of these, there was a generic notion of irrationality. Um, so that was your genus, irrationality. And it was specified or divided into two parts. Um, and he uses this phrase, like a left and right hand. So, you know, um, uh, we can kind of, you know, see how, how, you know, in a sense, that's kind of suggesting something like a symmetry or a kind of, you know, um, a kind of interconnection. So the generic notion of irrationality is divided into two parts, like a left and a right hand. Uh, the left hand, is love as a madness, is negative. The right hand, love as a madness that is divine. And so in both situations, we are agreeing that madness in kind of uh, that, that love kind of embodies an irrationality. Um, so we're agreeing on that, but we're, did, we're, we're making a distinction between, you know, the kind of irrationality that we, we've got. Um, in front of us and so it's that kind of thing that is you, you know it, it, this is this is the way in which this sort of dialectic um, big posh name for something that actually most of us probably do a little bit in practice just generally but that's the big posh name for this kind of process of um, you know working out what goes together and working out what doesn't working out how to collect working out how to divide now the method of collection um, Again, this is Phaedrus 265, and let's just, let's just quote Socrates here to sort of, you know, give you an example of what we're talking about. Um, 
The method of collection is to take a synoptic view, in other words, an overview, a broad view, a synoptic view of many scattered particulars and collect them under a single generic term, a single kind of group term. Um, and we do that in order to form a definition um, in each case. Uh, and we also do it to make clear the exact nature of the subject one proposes to expound. So what are you going to talk about? And he again gives an example, um, and to, this is again quoting him. In our recent speech on love, we began by defining what love is. That definition may have been good or bad, but at least it enabled the argument to proceed with clearness and consistency. Now, that's a very, um, that's a very important thing to, to note. At least it enabled the argument to proceed with clearness and consistency. Now, what that is, is focusing on is the role of the definition in the argument. So the role of the definition is not to essentially, <laughs> in a sense, it's not to be right. That's not the role of the definition. The role of the definition is to be clear. Um, so it's not, the first question is not, is the definition correct? That's not the first question we need to ask. The first question we need to ask is, is the definition clear? Does it enable us to have any clear sense of the thing that's being defined. And only if it does can we then maybe think about its correctness. But if it's not clear in the first place, we're kind of we're kind of up 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 a up a dirty creek with a very bad tool. Anyway, so this 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 role of the definition um, and with regard to getting clarity in the argument is crucial. Again, what what Socrates is trying to do here is is it's not absolutely focused on the content we've moved away from discussing whether you know the lover is irrational or not and we are now discussing how we're going to be able to think about this how we're going to talk about this how we're going to think about this um, and those those lessons about how we're going to talk about it how we're going to think about it these are lessons that are, are more broadly applicable So having um, sketched out that method, and it is a bit of a sketch, I mean, we have to kind of fill in some of the gaps and work out how these things operate. But having sketched out his method of dialectic, um, Socrates turns to the very specific techniques of rhetoric, the things the kind of rhetoric teacher um, will uh, be doing. Um, and he goes through a whole series of things, and there's a conversation they have about someone called Titius, not Lysias, but Titius, um, who's a teacher of rhetoric, um, and there's a whole sort of series of uh, techniques, um, you know, I mean, we, we can, we, we're may, maybe all familiar with like things like alliteration, um, so the big bad boy bounced the ball badly, um, <laughs> it's a terrible piece of alliteration, but you know what I mean, there's that kind of, what's going on there is, you know, you're using a sound, you're repeating a sound, it causes a kind of rhythmical um, nature to the to the speech and there's a whole series of these techniques um, some of which are kind of to do with the sound and some of which are to do with the content that teachers of rhetoric will give you. Now what Socrates does and this is kind of important um, is he essentially says that what exactly are they teaching you when they teach you all these lovely techniques maybe alliteration maybe you go to your creative writing class or whatever and they teach you a whole bunch of of techniques um, what Socrates does is his argument against this is that all they can teach you is stuff that, you, that you're going to kind of need to know. Um, he calls this preliminary knowledge. You're going to need to know either explicitly or implicitly a whole bunch of these techniques, um, but they're not going to teach you anything. You're not going to learn anything from these techniques themselves. They are essentially packaging to content. They are um, a mode of presentation to content, um, and they're not themselves a content. And more importantly, <coughs> and there's a kind of crucial thing that we're kind of that I'm going to kind of um, uh, I'm, this is this is this is a little bit of a distortion. So uh, I, I, this is not you know this is kind of pushing a little bit further than really what Socrates or Plato says. Um, but this is a way in which we might think about it. 
that's a bit more contemporary perhaps but one of the things that we might want to say is that if, if they learn about if, if the person learns a bunch of rules about rhetoric or how to speak well or how to write well um, they can learn those rules uh, but they don't know when to apply them um, they haven't yet learned how to apply the particular rule and, and in which case it works and sometimes we can we kind of perhaps see this you know when when people are trying to correct each other on a facebook post or on a twitter you know thing and then you end up with this kind of strange discussion between grammar nazis and stuff uh, and and you're thinking well you know s t technically speaking they're correct your grammar was bad but you know practically speaking we can kind of see that this isn't really the, the, the right place for them to point this out to you it's really not really that relevant and it kind of distracts from what you're trying to do um and it's a little bit policing and it's all kind of there's all sorts of weird things going on there that the person probably who's trying to correct your grammar probably doesn't mean to do particularly but they're they're they're, they're not they're not really applying the rule of grammar they're not using that rule and applying it or, or, or presenting it to to you as something to be applied at the right point in time that it's not appropriate at the particular point in time and so rules and when to apply rules are two different things you know and so you can know that uh, you know, you can know that something is the case. You can know that something, um, you know, A has to, you know, A, A and B are connected and B follows A. Oh, here's Christine. <laughs> um, say hello to the stream, darling. <laughs> um, so you can know, you can know a particular rule. So we we call that know that, you know. Um, so you know that this rule is important, but you don't know how. Um, the rule is going to be applied or how the rule should be applied and there's a difference between what we can call propositional knowledge knowledge that I, I know that and something follows that particular statement I know that you know the sky is blue let's say um, propositional knowledge and what we might call practical knowledge or know-how and I know how um, you know to uh, I know how to change the oil in my motorbike um, now, now that's a kind of you know crucial distinction that it, it's a contemporary distinction between propositional and practical knowledge uh, between a know that and know how kind of knowledge um, but it's the kind of distinction that we can perhaps read um, usefully into what Plato is talking about and what Socrates in particular is talking about when he kind of dismisses the teaching of rhetoric as the teaching of techniques that are just preliminary knowledge Now, the next thing that Socrates does, <laughs> and I'm going to stop in for a little break in about five, ten minutes. Um, the next thing Socrates does is a little strange. I mean, and this, it, I've just put it up here you know, bluntly. Um, he begins to talk about the need for philosophical chatter. What on earth does the, all this philosophical chatter, what's the point of it? And so after trashing um, traditional rhetoric as the teaching of uh, mere technique, um, threadbare is the word he uses it, and this is at 268. Um, Socrates claims, and he uses an example again, there's lots of examples in the Phaedrus, um, he uses an example again uh, when he's talking about Pericles. So all the great arts, he says, need to be supplemented by philosophical chatter and daring speculation about the nature of things. Let's emphasise that, the nature of things. So from this source appear to come the sublimity of thought and all-round completeness which characterises them. Now that that idea um, that somehow, and, and it's a very strange word, and it's obviously there's a translation difficulty here, but that idea that all the great arts need to be supplemented by philosophical chatter, um, this is kind of, yeah, on the face of it, a kind of strange notion. I think I think the the I mean obviously it's incredibly arrogant as well. Like everything you do, you're going to need some of us philosophers to come along and chat to you about the really important stuff, the nature of things. And if you don't have that chat, then you know what you're doing is kind of threadbare and technique. I mean, this is an incredibly arrogant position for a philosopher to present themselves in. Um, and and Plato, I don't think, has any great problem with that arrogance. <laughs> I I personally do. I think there's a there's a difficulty there. But that idea that you the the the, the philosophical chatter, um, uh, let's try and read him generously. I think it, it's connected to that idea about when you're doing the division, you have to divide things up according to the way in which the world kind of is, not just the way in which you want to make it. Um, you have to kind of pay attention. There's a kind of connection between the patterns in the world and the way in which 
um, you know, you're going to do your division and collection. And I, I, I think a similar kind of thought here. We're again talking about the nature of things, and and it's this same kind of thought where where, in a sense, it's it's too easy for techniques particularly things like techniques of persuasion because this is in the background to what's going on with rhetoric and the teaching of rhetoric and how to speak and how to write well is is there's a huge background here in terms of political persuasion um and if you i think read chunks particularly around the myth of the cicadas um you can see this kind of political backdrop playing out uh now this this is fake news. This is the kind of you know bullshit you know uh, politician. This is the kind of you know politicians always lie. This is it's this kind of uh, thing that I think Plato and Socrates are kind are, are responding to, um, and responding in a sense to any any idea that um, techniques of persuasion are autonomous. Um, that they essentially, if they're not located in a strong connection with the real world, the nature of things, if they're not located in a strong connection with a particular kind of aim, and this comes back to learning. In other words, if you're just trying to persuade someone of something that's not worthy, not useful, not good, um, then you're doing something wrong. And I think this is kind of crucial. This is fundamental to what's going on um, inside the Phaedrus and what's going on generally here. So I'm just going to um, recap a little bit and then we're going to take a break and then we'll talk a little bit more about the end part of the Phaedrus. So to focus on this idea of dialectic, which is what we kind of need to have in hand, um, first of all, we can think division and collection. These are its two elements. Um, we can have that we can look at and practice the uh, the first two speeches that are given um, as part of one process. There are two different uh, divisions that are made in terms of uh, two different specifications made um, in terms of uh, you know what's irrational. Um, we can also see that in, that dialectic is not just about a particular technique there's also an art involved in application um, and this is to add something in but this is to try and summarize a little bit and the aim of this dialectic is to go beyond the empirical and this is something that we'll have to explore in more depth through the course because this is going to be one of the crucial moments um, this aim to go beyond the empirical um, we we need Socrates says more than a mere empirical knack um, now, at, at, at the heart of all of this, and this is this is what we're trying to sort of like uh, do through this course, is is the, the heart of all of this, according to Deleuze, at least, is this process of selection taking place. This is really what's going on. It's not really someone like Deleuze might argue about some sort of neutral knowledge that we're trying to gain, which is definitely the way in which it comes across in some sense from. Um, Socrates, um, although perhaps not neutral is not the right word, right knowledge, divine knowledge perhaps, um, but there's a kind of neutrality to the to, to what's going on. It's it's kind of like, you know, the person who wants to know would, would, would follow this supposedly. Um, but in fact, the argument's going to be is that, is that it, these techniques are, are being deployed always as part of a process of selection to select the right one, the person who can, the person who, who is the right one. Um, and the examples given of me medicine, music, poetry, um, and of rhetoric and speaking um, involved in all of these examples are false claimants. Okay, so there's always people who are making false claims. I can do medicine, I can do music, I can do poetry, I can speak well, etc., etc. And there are always people who, uh, in the background to the examples that are given by Socrates, there are always people who are essentially false claimants to these particular, um, you know, titles of someone who can, who can, you know, um, uh, uh, give you give you medical advice, for example. So there's always false claimants involved. And so what's going on always is the selection of a correct or a good claimant. Um, anyway, we're going to uh, just, as I say, pause now. Um, and what I'm going to do is just is just leave up uh, this little piece here. Uh, let me just pop it up for you. Um, and this is to begin again to make some connections with, with the Deleuze. Um, and the connection that we're going to make... And that, and that we're going to begin to explore is is one of, one of is around Deleuze's um, concept of an idea, 
uh, and the role of the idea in learning. And this is this is Deleuze. The idea is not the element of knowledge, but that of an infinite learning, which is of a different nature to knowledge. And this is close to what I'm talking about in terms of the content and, and the process, or the content and the method. Don't worry too much about the content. Think more about the method and the role of the idea in that kind of method. So just to repeat that, the idea is not the element of knowledge, but that of an infinite learning, inverted commas, Deleuze uses that word, um, which is of a different nature to knowledge. So when you're learning, it's in a different nature to when you're knowing. Um, and the role of ideas, this is again, this is kind of Deleuze, the role of ideas in Plato, when we're taken, when we're putting them into that, framework of the dialectical method um, is not as content the ideas are not content but they are means to something um, and here i'm going to use the phrase means as scenes because deleuze talks about the way in which ideas are dramatized he talks about what he calls the method of dramatization and a theater um, and that we have uh, things he calls conceptual persona so you know whether it be truth or justice you know or you know the the thinker these are not just abstract ideas you have to kind of embody them into a scene as a character and see how they're playing out and that's exactly what we're doing when we're looking at Plato's um, work so I'm going to take a five minute break it's 7 36 I'm going to return at 7 41 um, and then we'll we'll have the last section of the lecture um, before we stop for a seminar at about five to eight. Okay, so I'll see you in five minutes.
Okay. Socrates brings speculation sounds like pub chat. <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> I don't think that would be that far from the truth. Okay, so welcome back. Um, this is Free University of Brighton, um, of course, on Plato and Deleuze. And I just want to end by talking a little bit about uh, the kind of process of learning that's um, going on in, in the dialogue. And, and I think it's easy in some sense for us to get a sense of this um, when we look at the example of writing and the problem that uh, Socrates slash Plato uh, assign to writing. So on the one hand, writing um, hasn't got the ability to defend itself. It can't engage in dialogue. Uh, which is an odd claim, obviously, because not only are they engaged in some kind of dialogue about Lysias's writing, the first speech of the text, but we're also engaged in some kind of dialogue, as have been people from millennia, um, about the text. <laughs> so there's a kind of oddness about that. But, you know, on the face of it, we can kind of see what he means. You know, um, it's very difficult to, you know, be certain that you're not misreading a text because the text can't stand up and correct you when you start getting it wrong um, but that element it has to be connected that that sense that writing can't defend itself has to be connected i think to the way in which uh, the techniques of rhetoric that you're being taught um, uh, what, what you're not being taught is how to use them so one of the arguments that socrates makes is that you know um, the ability to use the right technique at the right time the ability to say the right thing to the right person um, this is kind of crucial um, and you can't be you know this is not something you can be taught and so I think when we when we think about the sort of discussion around writing um, we can obviously you know, follow the Derridian line about presence and absence and all these other kind of things, which it, it, which is there in writing. I mean, without a doubt, there's a sense in which you know it, it's it's a very peculiar process to read something that's you know hundreds of years old, or even just to read something from somebody who's not who's not around. Um, you know, uh, I mean, it's a very peculiar process to have their words sort of allowed and alive, but. I think in the context of the Phaedrus, um, and I think in the context of the dialectic as a method, what's more important to think about than whether a, a text can defend itself is how the right text can be read at the right time. Um, <laughs> that's plainly not going to, you know, that's almost not possible. Um, just like, you know, how to, how to say the right thing to a student at the right time. Um, this is a very complicated sort of uh, a complicated practice um, and it's one of the difficulties uh, involved in um, things like online teaching like this uh, you know te it's one of the difficulties involved in the idea that teaching can be kind of somehow packaged up and delivered out um, as though the same thing can be understood by everybody and if you can't understand it then somehow you're a bit dumb you know um, and the intelligent people can understand it uh, that's a really, really problematic kind of uh, situation. Um, not just for practical reasons, you know, um, but that. But it is this kind of problem that Plato and Socrates are pointing to, um, that that learning involves not just a process of an empty vessel being filled up. It involves this process of a dialogue, but it involves a process of a dialogue in which both parties have to kind of respond to the other. And the capacity to establish a relationship that works, what we would call a, pedag a successful pedagogic relationship, um, the, the capacity to establish that is, is not, you know, uh, it's much more of an art than it is a skill. I mean, it, there's not simply a series of, of techniques that can be done, uh, and that can be taught rather and learned. Although those, as Socrates points out, are good preliminaries. There's certain things that can be done. Now the idea here, and this is kind of crucial, is that what's, what's really going on in learning, because we know that people, ourselves included, learn um, from stuff that, uh, that um, 
you know, is generic, let's say. It's generic content. And we can all learn a, a certain amount by that. But that's, you know, so, so maybe it's an online course or maybe it's, you know, maybe it's learning to, to pass your driving test or something. We all know that we can learn a sort of a certain amount from a bunch of generic stuff. But we don't really, I mean, I want to try and sort of say something like we don't really think of that as, 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 as what matters when we're learning. Um, we have to kind of identify moments at which what you learn mattered to you. It wasn't just uh, a process of getting from A to B. It wasn't just a process of getting a certificate in order to do something like a you know, particular job. It wasn't a process of passing a test in order to get a license for something. It wasn't part of that process. Think about an example of learning that mattered. Um, learning that mattered. Learning that, let's say, uh, changed you. Um, and that was where, where someone like a teacher was involved. It's this process that Socrates and Plato want to defend, and it's this process that writing can't fulfil, um, nor can the some person who just learns the technique of good writing, nor can the person who just learns the technique of good speaking. They can't learn to fulfil um, how to establish the relationship between a a knower and, and a learner, a, te a teacher and a, and a, and a, and a student. Um, because that relationship, Socrates seems to want to imply, has... has um <laughs> and now here we have to, again, we have to kind of unpack the language. That relationship is a relationship of souls, um, not of intellects. Uh, it's a relationship of people, persons, characters, you know, uh, intimate individuals. It's not a relationship of something abstract in the head or in a book. Uh, and it's that that Socrates wants to keep pushing towards. Um, and for him, particularly for, uh, uh, particularly when talking about knowledge and, and philosophy, for him, what's being taught is how to relate to, how to uh, engage with, um, and how to uh, develop a kind of um, a direction towards the truth that is informed by the good, informed by the divine, if you like, um, and how to maintain that kind of, you know, right path. And I think what's kind of, what's kind of happened very, very heavily in our reading and understanding of Socrates um, is that uh, the elements that sound too much like Buddhism or Eastern mysticism or some other kind of esoteric practice, um, any of those elements have been kind of, you know, obliterated. We're kind of, we kind of have them wiped out. And, and if we wipe them out, um, if we try and think of Socrates as some jolly, ugly fellow down the road who's chatting, <laughs> maybe in the pub or whatever, um, and, but he, who's basically just like a university lecturer. If we, if we model Socrates on the contemporary academic, um, we've actually got it completely arse over tit. I mean, for Socrates, the contemporary academic is the sophist. By far, this is absolutely clear. They, they, you know, capacity, technique, you know, and presentation of knowledge, you know, the relationship in the end to students is is kind of kind of irrelevant in most cases. Even though the, the, the academics themselves know that that's the most important element, these things kind of get dropped out, and and so what we have is 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 a kind of uh, a commercialized, an instrumentalized mode of education and so education is always education for something um, for a job for a higher wage for um, you know some other practical you know element of life it's not education aimed at how to know the good and how to have um, uh, uh, you know a good life as a human being or how to you know um, act well um, how to be able to work out other p with regard to other people who, who who is acting well and who is not you know it's it's not uh, an education aimed at what matters um, in other words it's not aimed at our souls um, even though we might find in the humanities in particular a whole bunch of academics you know often defending that as their own and so Socrates is really really heavily focused on this particular uh, purpose and it, without without sort of reading and I don't, you don't need to agree with this purpose it's, you know you might think this is all just you know there is no you might think there's no soul there's no point in this that's that's you know um 
that's absolutely fine. And that's a, a completely valid opinion if you want to start from that point, or valid premise, I would rather say, if you want to start from that point. But what's crucial in terms of us reading Plato is, I think, to remember that this is not uh, a contemporary academic situation in which some sort of abstract, you know, neutral knowledge is being taught. This is a very live, specific, intimate pedagogic relationship in something um, in which something like the divine is 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 crucial, um, and the relationship to that is crucial. And and, if, and now this is this is. Uh, I mean, there's there's been a huge sort of sort of shift and change as we go through the centuries in terms of how Plato is read, um, and it's only relatively recently that we've begun to um, take seriously what sometimes it is called the esoteric reading, which the esoteric in this situation it, it just means inside the walls. So let's imagine a kind of inside and an outside teaching. So a teaching that takes place inside the walls inside the walls of the academy perhaps and then another teaching that takes place in sort of public so this might be for example a public space in which i teach and the seminar um, that the free university brighton people go to at eight o'clock that's a bit more internal it's a bit more inside the walls so it's, it's we're only just talking about that kind of distinction but esoteric also has a, con a connotation of um, connection to mysticism a connection to religion a connection to things like sorcery and magic um, it also has this connection to secret knowledge. And so often it's kind of rejected as, you know, um, uh, emperor's new clothes kind of process. There's not really anything there. There's not really any secret. It's just a process of manipulation, etc., etc., which again may or may not be valid. But within, within Plato and Socrates, there is very clearly a kind of um, sort of, or well, at least we now sort of more regularly uh, are allowed to interpret them in, in the following way. There's, there seems to be clearly a kind of distinction between what can be said, what can be said out loud, what can be said for a general public, and what has to be tailored to the individual, specifically sort of adjusted for the particular soul that you're encountering. And in that sense, esoteric doesn't mean secret. It means specific. Um, there's a way in which y you as an individual hear something that I might say that's specific to you um, and there might be a way in which you can't hear something I'm saying or you hear something that uh, you know that I didn't mean to say um, but your ear and my mouth connect in a particularly kind of strange way that's a very horrible image I don't want to you know <laughs> I don't want to dwell on that image but there's a kind of relationship uh, that needs to be acknowledged in which there isn't a passivity on the part of the student or a passivity on the part of the learner and an activity on the part of the teacher. There's a kind of I interrelationship um, that needs to be continuously adjusted to enable the teaching to be encountered by that specific person in this and to, for them to get out of it the same as someone else who's going to need a different kind of lesson, a different set of words, a different tone and perhaps a different kind of instruction even. Um, so from an exoteric or outside content, which everyone can share, there then becomes the process of the inside or esoteric content, which is involved in the way in which someone learns and the way in which we teach. And so this distinction between the reality of the specific individual who's learning and the generic content of what they are learning, and I think this distinction is much more important when we're thinking about what's going on. Um, inside something like the Phaedrus and inside um, Socrates is you know, a diff attack, if you like, or, or, or you know, denigration of something like writing. Now we're going to talk a little bit about hopefully learning and stuff inside the seminar. So if you are with the Free University of Brighton, um, then um, the seminar link is in River. I will post it up again in a couple of minutes, just so that you know it at the end of the chat. And we'll be joining there, um, at a, I will be starting there just after 8 o'clock. So get yourself along and get yourself logged in there. If you're not with River, if you're not on, on River, you're not with the Free University of Brighton, I do have a Discord, you're welcome to um, follow along there, ask questions. If you've got something specific to say, then you can say it there. If you've got readings you need to find, we can help out with that. Um, and so you can check the Discord on my Twitch page. Um, I think that's it for tonight. Um, God, yeah. it was a big, 
big move and everything's been shifted so i'll probably talk a little bit about that during the week i might hopefully get online and do a bit of gaming during the week so maybe you'll catch me doing that i will finish off there next week we will begin looking at the sophist so if you are reading along with this course then begin reading the sophist um, if you've got a nice um, hack it copy here's my hack it copy i love this version it's bloody great um then grab one of those um, have a good read as far as you can um, and we'll start looking at that next week thanks very much um, see you all soon